John Carpenter helped create an entire genre with his slasher classic Halloween, and his subsequent work has become a cornerstone of cult cinema. But how did a kid from Kentucky grow into the elder statesman of modern horror? Why did he transition into a music career? And what makes his film so undeniably awesome? This is The Evolution of John Carpenter. Starting with his early years. Carpenter grew up obsessed with B-movies and schlocky monster flicks, and as a kid, he began shooting his own on 8mm film. He enrolled at Western Kentucky University, where he encountered the inspiration for his most terrifying creation. On a class trip to a mental institution, Carpenter came across a 12-year-old boy who was a patient there. The aspiring director never forgot the child's unsettling stare and empty eyes, and used him as the basis for Michael Myers in his breakout hit, Halloween. Death has come to your little town, Sheriff. You can either ignore it or you can help me to stop it. Carpenter transferred to the School of Cinematic Arts at USC, but he soon dropped out to make his mark on Hollywood. Carpenter's directorial debut was Dark Star, an extremely low-budget sci-fi film co-written by Dan O'Bannon, who would later incorporate elements into his script for Alien. With a budget of only $60,000, Carpenter had to compose the score himself out of necessity, and the lo-fi synthesizer sound has since become a staple of his work. He followed up Dark Star with the exploitation classic Assault on Precinct 13, a gritty action thriller about a gang holding a police station under siege. Carpenter's raw filmmaking style was tailor-made for the ultra-violent modern-day western inspired by Rio Bravo and its success overseas gave him a rep for making big bucks on a low budget. When producer Mustafa Akkad saw Precinct 13, he realized that Carpenter could bring his vision of a babysitter stalking slasher to life and hired him to make Halloween. Carpenter and his then girlfriend Deborah Hill wrote the script for Halloween in 10 days under the original title of The Babysitter Murders. Their shooting schedule was just as tight, with only four weeks and $200,000 available to sculpt a masterpiece of modern horror. To stretch the budget as far as possible, Carpenter mostly hired a cast of unknowns, including a 19-year-old Jamie Lee Curtis as Laurie Strode, and used spray paint and scissors to transform a $2 Captain Kirk mask into one of horror's most iconic characters. What do you look like? The Boogeyman. In the hands of a lesser director, Halloween could have been nothing more than a disposable B-movie. But Carpenter's voyeuristic POV shots, haunting score, and innovative use of jump scares elevated the movie into something truly special. When it was released in 1978, the extremely cheap film made over $70 million, kicking off the slasher movie phenomenon, and establishing Carpenter as one of Hollywood's most dependable and profitable directors. Unfortunately, his box office success would screech to a halt in the 80s where his work was awesome but unappreciated. Carpenter followed up Halloween with The Fog, another atmospheric horror film starring Jamie Lee Curtis and actress Adrienne Barbeau, who the director married after working with her on a TV movie two years earlier. Speaking of TV, that's also where he met one of his most iconic collaborators and closest friends, Kurt Russell. Carpenter directed him in a 1979 biopic of Elvis Presley and went on to cast him as the unkillable Snake Plissken in the action epic Escape from New York. Heard you were dead. As well as R.J. McCready in The Thing. Today, the 1982 film is heralded as a high water mark for sci fi cinema, and its practical effects set a standard that CGI can't touch. But on its initial release, The Thing was considered a massive disappointment. Critics hated it, and in the summer of 82, movie audiences were more interested in a cute and cuddly alien like E.T., as opposed to Carpenter's intense body horror. Carpenter was crushed by The Thing's failure, and followed it up with two films that he hoped would have wider appeal. The so-so Stephen King adaptation, Christine, and the surprisingly sentimental Starman, which was his first and so far only film to earn an Academy Award nomination. He made one last attempt at the mainstream with the 1986 action comedy, Big Trouble in Little China. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry, I'm just thrilled to be alive. Yeah, sure. Let's go. <sighs> but when it bombed at the box office, Carpenter finally gave up on his dreams of big studio success and focused back on the small-scale cult cinema that made his career in the first place, before eventually transitioning from movies to music. 
While he'd never set the box office on fire again, Carpenter continued to innovate and entertain through the late 80s, from dabbing in surrealism with Prince of Darkness to directing the late great Roddy Piper in the dystopian delight called They Live. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bubblegum. The wise-ass wrestler was one of his favorite collaborators, but as he entered the 90s, the quality of Carpenter's films took a steep decline. In the Mouth of Madness was a strong finish to his Apocalypse trilogy that started with The Thing, but his next few follow-ups failed to impress. Even reuniting with Kurt Russell for Escape from LA couldn't turn the tide, and after 2001's Ghost of Mars, Carpenter announced his retirement from movie making. Since then, he's contributed to a few anthology series, directed the feature film The Ward in 2010, and even dabbled in his other passion, video games. But lately, Carpenter's main focus has been his music. As modern audiences rediscovered his work, his synthesizer scores have gained an all-new appreciation, and in 2015, Carpenter debuted his first album of original compositions called Lost Themes. At the tender age of 67, the director went on tour as a performing musician for the very first time, but despite loving life on the road, Carpenter isn't completely done with his movies. He's deeply involved in the upcoming Halloween remake, serving as an executive producer, creative consultant, and composer. The fact that the new film is ignoring all of the sequels except for Carpenter's original classic is a testament to how much respect the filmmaker has earned over the years. A lot of his movies were simply ahead of their time, but they survived thanks to a passionate cult fan base and the singular vision of the master who made them. Thanks for watching The Evolution Of. We'd love to know who you want to see covered in future installments, so leave a comment below. And while you're down there, please subscribe to Now This Entertainment.